So hey, everybody. Uh, who here has a Fitbit? Raise it. Oh, it's a couple of you guys. Wearable, wearable, wrist-worn wearable. How about that? More of you, most of you, actually. Any UXers in the house? Wow, that's a lot of you, and you all sit together. That's great. <laughs> OK, so, um, so humor, we, we just met, but humor me for a second. Um, I'm going to show you this two-minute video. It is called The Future of Healthcare, and I found it on The Economist. Hit it. Humankind has reached a turning point in its ongoing journey to preserve and improve our quality of life. We are at the forefront of these continuous advances, allowing us to watch over ourselves as part of an interconnected ecosystem. Technology now has the power to connect doctor, patient, and community as never before, integrating healthcare into our daily lives from the very beginning to our twilight years. As the greater population shifts their healthcare focus from treating illness and injury to sustained wellness, a new normal begins to arise where technology augments our understanding of what care can mean. Technology increases the efficiency of delivering care while reducing barriers to collecting and sharing critical information about our daily well being. Dramatic changes in healthcare are already taking place. Smarter wearable connected devices now provide more profound round-the-clock monitoring in tandem with portable and even non-invasive scanning equipment, promoting greater mobility for healthcare professionals. Patients and physicians will discover more applications for virtual and augmented reality, such as doctor instruction and in aiding procedures. Artificial intelligence and big data will hasten the discovery of pharmaceutical cures for new diseases and will continue to offer more accurate and extensive patient records through the cloud. The C's are in place for a dramatic overhaul of the practice of medicine as we know it today. As behavior changes to match the evolution of data, we will start to see the formation of... Wow, that was aspirational. Holy cow. My favorite part is when they uh, say twilight years is a euphemism for dying. Um, so these ideas have been floating around for a really long time. And we're not quite there yet. And there's a lot of field studying where, what stands in the way of this super connected future. There's health, uh, organizational science, computer science, computer supported cooperative work, uh, communication, all sorts of all sorts of disciplines trying to learn more about this. And so here's a small sample of what they found. There's people, technology, and organization. These are the big buckets where our findings are in when it comes to understanding what it takes to get this data from these wearables or all this technology, these sensors, into the healthcare environment. So just to give you a quick example from each of these, starting with the organization. Well, how does an organization incentivize providers to spend time outside of your appointment to review this spreadsheet of data that you might have emailed them. Sometimes doctors don't get paid for that, and so they don't. You come in for your 10 minutes appointment, and they say, well, do you want to talk to me for 10 minutes, or do you want me to sit here and review your data for 10 minutes? It's easy to choose. In terms of the technology, well, is the data transferred to the doctor in the same place that all the other data lives? Is it in the, does it live in the electronic medical record, or do they need another login to get to your data? Um, what about security concerns? A lot of the new technology has a lot of security loopholes that haven't yet been addressed and therefore can't enter the clinical space. Is your provider uh, trained to interpret the data? This new technology comes out and it doesn't really quite match their mental models for what they currently look at or where they look at it, maybe it loses meaning. And also, there could be a perceived imbalance in the value of data. So if you as a patient brings in your information and the doctor goes, ah, not really something I can use right now, that imbalance also causes some relationship strains. And what about mental health? Well, mental health is particularly difficult to study, all the way from diagnoses, which aren't always clear, uh, treatment that takes a while, and measuring progress isn't always straightforward, and I'll, tell, I'll talk more about that later. And this is on top of the issues that I just mentioned earlier. 
So today I'm going to talk about my research in the integration of new wearable technology into a mental health care clinic in Chicago, barriers to reaching its full potential, and also opportunities for existing technology, hint, Fitbit, to improve care today. Uh, and so while there are amazing people on the stage today and in this room that are working hard to bring mental health closer to the patient and the person, that, person in need, um, a lot of mental health care is still best provided in the clinic uh, with therapists for some people. In particular, I currently conduct research with a program that provides therapy for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So, other people mentioned PTSD here. I'll give a really quick overview of what that is. So PTSD is a debilitating condition uh, that can develop after exposure to a traumatic experience. So this could be uh, actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. And symptoms can include uh, intrusive memories and nightmares, um, cognitive and mood imbalance, in, uh, which includes depression and inappropriate self-blame, perhaps to the event that occurred. Avoidance, in which the individual purposefully avoids uh, memories of the event. And hyperarousal symptoms, where the, the individual is hyper alert and irritable, and perhaps also lead, this could also lead to sleep disruption. And PTSD is often treated with bi weekly or monthly visits to a therapist. Lots of different types of therapy going on there that other speakers have spoken about. Um, However, not all general family therapists are equipped to work with a veteran population. So sometimes military culture or um, hierarchy has played a part in the, in the traumatic narrative that perhaps is difficult for veterans to speak to, when, speak to with a therapist when they don't quite understand some of the, all, all of the attributes that went into this, this trauma. And that's why the intensive outpatient program exists. So there's a couple of intensive outpatient programs. The one I work with is uh, at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, and I'm gonna call it the IOP for short. But uh, the IOP program is a three-week daily intensive treatment program for veterans with PTSD that have perhaps tried other forms of treatment and it hasn't quite been effective. So what happens is veterans from all over the US, 13 every month, are flown to Chicago and one family member or loved one, um, free of charge. And Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. through 5 p.m., they receive a whole slew of different types of therapy. Um, and why do they need to do this? Well, part of avoidance is not wanting to talk about your trauma and also finding distractions. And so taking them out of their home environment and out of their work environment allows them to pay attention to their trauma for three weeks. So where, what do they get for these three weeks? They get individual therapy daily, group therapy daily, medication management if needed, but they have, also have this other component. It's a very holistic program. I love this program, you'll, you'll see. Um, they get yoga, art therapy, nutrition, acupuncture if they want it, and actually, so there's these two different cohorts. There's uh, combat trauma cohort, primarily male, um, majority of the IOP patients. Um, but then there's also military sexual trauma, Primarily, uh, primarily women, and they found within the military sexual trauma cohort, there is, they were finding more interpersonal issues. I mean, military sexual trauma surrounds trust and those types of, um, uh, those types of, of issues. So they actually added a new course for emotion regulation and interpersonal relationship management for that. So this is a very, very nimble organization that goes um, week by, uh, month by month trying to see what can we improve, how do we change, how do we add to this regimen that we don't already have. So they're, they're fantastic. Um, and they also get a complimentary, free, complimentary Fitbit when, upon arrival. Um, what is a Fitbit? Well, for anyone here who doesn't know, I'm just going to so it's a, it's a, it's a wrist-worn wearable. You can track your heart rate, also partial, partially a pedometer, um, sleep disruption. I'm wearing one right now, and I have always wanted to do this. I'm going to check my heart rate while I'm on stage. 84. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. This is great. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Okay, so we have an opportunity here. So we have, we have an opportunity to study new technology being uh, kind of like this glorious technology that was shown in the video earlier, um, 
in a nimble, holistic environment that really cares about the whole, the whole body, the mind, um, physical body, and uh, really, really understands being at the forefront of treatment. And so, how did they use it? Well, what we found was, ah, eh, they didn't really, at least, at least not formally. So when I interviewed some therapists, some of them said, we give them what? Oh, that's why, that, that's why they all have therapists. We give it to them. Great, awesome, great, I didn't know. Um, and some of the patients that got it said, ah, this is a cool gift. Not sure why they gave it to me, because this is a Fitbit that's for physical health, right? I came here for my mental health therapy, so I mean, sure, this is, this is fine. Um, and so uh, the idea that we could just give this patient a Fitbit and then throw them into treatment and think that everything is well and connected um, didn't, didn't happen in even such an awesome environment such as this one. So the question is why? Um, but before we get there, I guess I get asked this question really often. Well, what's the point? Can wearables actually make a positive impact in mental health? A lot of people ask that. Um, and why bother talking about integrating wearables and new technology into mental health when we don't even know if it actually does anything? Well, it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation. It's difficult to study how impactful technology is going to be in a new environment unless it's well integrated. It's also difficult to get people to invest in integration if they don't have evidence that it's actually going to do anything later. But good thing, we have promising research when it comes to self-tracking and the use of wearables in health. A um, bunch of studies, they just listed one, but there's so many more. Uh, increasing physical activity is linked to decreased depression and post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Um, Patient provider communication, uh, so having more, having the patient bring in more data is shown to aid in medication adherence and improve diagnosis. So the more information you have, the better diagnosis it is, but also the better communication you might have with the healthcare provider, which then gives the patient buy-in to actually adhere to medication. Um, increased self-awareness, uh, allowing, allowing people to track their own goals and their achievements can increase motivation and help them be more aware of their health and behaviors to facilitate behavior change. All right, well the next question, well actually the first question I usually I get asked is, well, well how could you use Fitbit in therapy for PTSD? Um, well, based on the interviews I had with the veterans that had completed the program and a bunch of the members of the clinical team, a couple of ways. Um, and I did mention that the Fitbit wasn't being formally integrated in the program, but that doesn't mean that they weren't using it. And so they were using it in their own little way. So first, we discussed, before, earlier we discussed how wearables can be used to increase physical activity, which could, which could decrease we should combat depression, but there's more to it than that. Um, a leading researcher on trauma, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, described PTSD as, at its core as a disconnect between physical body and mind. Your mind believes something, your body isn't reacting as your mind believes. So the mind can, um, the mind can know that there's no harm present, but your body might not react in that way. Uh, and building that relationship back requires a healthy body. So we saw that the nutritionist was one of the few members of the clinical team that regularly used the Fitbit to help them adjust goals, check their fitness, et cetera. Uh, but the point of therapy, especially at the IOP, isn't just to reduce symptoms, but give veterans the skills they need to manage their symptoms once they go home. So this Fitbit, this gift that they were given to them is the only thing, aside from a lot of paperwork, that goes home with them once they leave. So in using the Fitbit as a, a, in their skills to manage their symptoms is a really great way to continue care post-IOP. So I have one, one favorite example. There was one veteran, he was uh, prone to outbursts. So and in one group therapy session, he had a conflict with another veteran and they had an altercation. The, veteran then had to go in and talk to the individual therapist. The individual therapist said, what happened there? And he said, I, I don't know. I just lost control. And, and then I blacked out. And then when I woke up, I felt like shit. Well, OK, well, let's, let's, talk, let's walk through those steps a little closer then. Well, did you see it coming? Did you, what did you feel before, before it happened? He said, well, I felt heat. And then I felt my heart rate my heart going, going crazy like it was going to jump out of my chest. And she said, well, actually, you have this Fitbit, right? Let's, do it. Let's go take a look. And so they open up the app, and they go back to the time where the, the altercation happened. And he looks at it, and he goes, oh, actually, my heart rate's a lot lower than it is 
even when I exercise. I'm like, okay, is, and he goes, is this accurate? And then the therapist was able to wave down a nurse because this program also has nurses on staff and say, hey, uh, he wants to see whether the, the heart rate monitor on the Fitbit is accurate. And so the nurse sat down with them, did the manual check, and they found, okay, this is actually a kind of reliable for this purpose. And, the, and then the individual therapist was able to go, well, actually, so next time you see that your heart rate is actually not going crazy, and you can recognize, the, uh, you can actually look and check and see and recognize when another episode is coming, maybe you could use this to manage your outbursts later in the future. As I mentioned earlier, 13 veterans get flown to Chicago every month, roughly 13. Um, and in that time, they actually live together in a nearby hotel, a hotel close to the facility. In fact, one of, the, one of the, my participants liked calling him the barracks because that's where, that's where they lived. Um, and I, and in, in this time, they actually form a close connection with each other. And uh, one participant, she was overweight and depressed. And one of her goals was, while I'm here in these three weeks, I want to walk one more step every day than I did yesterday. So if I did 5,000 steps yesterday, I want to make sure I hit 5,001 today. Except one day, she said, I'm fat, I'm depressed, I don't want to move, I'm done, I'm not doing this. And one of her, uh, one of her colleagues came over and said, hey, come on, we're doing this together. Look, we have this contest going on. You can do it, let's, let's go on this walking group together, and then they did. So this Fitbit facilitated, first was able to track their steps, and it was able to facilitate this interaction, encourage this um, during, during this therapeutic process. So going back to these three attributes, these are also barriers to more thoroughly integrating this Fitbit, more formally integrating it into therapy, because there's a lot of there's a lot of ways it could be used. So, um, including including the step count, um, one of the therapists wanted to say, "Well, actually, I would really like to see over the weekend how many steps they took. Are they withdrawing, or are they isolating themselves? Because that might be, not, that might be a sign that therapy isn't working." But anyway, there are these three large buckets that still stand in the way of this organization. So when it comes to, and this is specifically mental health again, um, when, when it comes to the organization, when I spoke to leadership, they said that they, their funding was very much tied to these traditional survey measures. In case anyone isn't familiar with this, and in psychology, a lot of symptom measures are self-report survey total. I'm sure a lot of people here have taken the PHQ-9 or some other type of mental health survey you're familiar with. Um, total up the points, check your, symptom out, check your symptomology. Uh, and so th their funding was specifically attached to lowering the score on, uh, for the veterans that are attending. They're not ranked on our patients got 20, on, on average, 20 more minutes of sleep, which matters a lot, or that they are f more physically active. That's not, how, that's not how the healthcare providers are incentivized to use the information. But, but the patients really care about that. A lot of times they said, they, they keep asking us to take these surveys, and I don't know what they, I don't, I don't care, but look, I'm actually sleeping more. Do you know how much I wanted to sleep 20 minutes more when I sleep three hours a day every day for the past 10 years? But of course, uh, the technology doesn't always allow that type of integration either. So when I spoke to the healthcare providers, they really, really, their job was on the line if these scores didn't go down. And so they always wanted to look at these, these, these survey measures. But at the same time, they thought this Fitbit data was interesting. Unfortunately, there was no connection there. They, weren't, they really wanted to see, well, if their depression score drops, is it because they got more sleep or did they also get more steps? You couldn't see that in one place and that was a technology issue too. They couldn't see these measures side by side. And of course, there's the people component to this. So it's, ve it's very, there's, veterans have, a lot of veterans, that I spoke to had a distrust in the healthcare process. They said things like, they weren't there. These doctors weren't there. They don't know what it's like. 
how can I open up to them? When they're talking about a very, very traumatic situation where they believe that it was their fault that their troop um, was, was, was attacked or some, in some way. Um, so when veterans already have this distrust on, and difficulty opening up to their doctors, to have the onus on them to bring their mobile phone to the therapist and say, hey, look at this, that's a very, that's a very difficult challenge to overcome. And furthermore, therapists might not know what to do with it. Not all the therapists I spoke to were very excited about the data. They thought, I think this is a toy. I don't really know what to do. I wasn't educated on this, and this has nothing to do with my job. I want nothing to do with it. Right now, it's not as much of a collaborative experience as much as the patient bringing up, hey, take a look. And that's why research is so critical in this space. I, I don't need to tell any of you here that when it comes to designing, creating, uh, tools when it comes to health, it's, it's, it's serious. And so research can help identify some of the current patterns and values of users. And when I say users, I don't just mean the patients, the healthcare providers are also a stakeholder and caregivers are also a stakeholder that, that is often overlooked. Um, but technology for mental health can actually break existing paradigms of what it means to treat mental health. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you.